So in this brief F, um, video, we're just going to take a look here at uh, the beginning of a period that is oftentimes referred to as the intertestinal period, but probably better referred to as the second temple period, and as back part of the background to the New Testament. And so here in this video, I'm just going to first of all deal with a general outline of the Bible and then jump to um, the uh, influence or the change with uh, the Greeks. When the Greeks came and um, became influential in the uh, Palestinian area, and then in subsequent uh, videos, I'll then explain a little bit about uh, the rise of resistance to um, Greek influence uh, and Hellenization. And then in another video, I will be talking uh, particularly about uh, Herod the Great. So and that will kind of take us up to uh, the beginning, as it were, of the birth of Jesus uh, and the kind of the start of the uh, accounts that we'll find in the Gospels uh, and in Acts and uh, the rest of the New Testament. So uh, first of all, here, as you can see in this uh, very brief uh, outline of Bible history, and by Bible history, I primarily mean the, the history, as it were, towards the end of what we oftentimes refer to as the Old Testament uh, or the Hebrew Scriptures to the time of the New Testament. And so basically I've just kind of divided it up here between two big chunks, two big periods, uh, the restoration of the Judeans, uh, which the key event of this period is the return uh, to Jerusalem uh, of those Judeans who had been taken into captivity uh, by the Babylonians. Uh, and so 586 is about the time that the um, Babylonians take over um, Jerusalem. Uh, they take many uh, Judeans, not, not all, but a good portion of Judeans, uh, into captivity, uh, where in captivity uh, the faith of these Judeans begin to, uh, de uh, to develop as they think about their land, as they think about their faith. Uh, and then it's during the time of the Persians, once the Persians have defeated the Babylonians, that they permit the Judeans uh, to return back to the land, uh, rebuild uh, Jerusalem. Of course, there was a military strategy with that uh, because the uh, Persians wanted a fortified city as it still had uh, battles or fights uh, with Egypt. And so it was good to have a kind of a vassal or a uh, supporting uh, community uh, in that region. So uh, they are allowed to return, and that, that return kind of marks the period, as it were, of much of the o Old Testament writings, although we do have uh, writings that are still talking about this return. Most likely it's Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, who are major characters, as well as Esther, who's kind of the queen in the Persian court. Uh, so the key scriptures uh, for this period of time of restoration is the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, also books like Haggai, Zechariah, Esther, again, uh, are some of the key scriptures that someone might want to read if they want to get an idea about this, this return. Of course, there are other uh, non-biblical books that can give uh, in information about that, but if you're looking kind of from scripture at what can tell you about this return and about the faith and about uh, expectations and hopes uh, during this period, uh, those would be some of the key scriptures. Now, then after they have returned uh, till the time of cap uh, from captivity to the time of the birth of Jesus marks another period. And so, uh, well, marking this is kind of the close of the Old Testament history because we're getting this uh, other books that are written. Um, with probably one uh, major exception, to the beginning of the first century CE. And so that is with the death of Herod the Great and kind of with the birth of Jesus that uh, you know, is happening either uh, in 4 BC, you know, if you're reading Matthew's Gospel, or 6 CE if you're reading Luke's Gospel. And um, so we basically, I, I'm having here 400 BCE uh, to... 4 B.C., 6 C, uh, C.E. So some of the major characters in the time, as I'll point out here, is Alexander the Great. And then there's a series of Greek rulers, primarily through the Ptolemies, who 
rule from Egypt and the Seleucids who rule from uh, Syria uh, until we get down to uh, Antiochus IV, who is a Seleucid ruler. And uh, he's going to be a key person, especially as we think about uh, resistance to Hellenization that will come from the people living in Jerusalem and, and Judea. Uh, and then there'll become a period of time of the Hasmoneans, which I'll have a video uh, about. Uh, and then um, until there's going to be kind of civil unrest or disturbance amongst the Hasmoneans. Uh, and then there's going to be an intervention with the Romans. Um, and the Romans are going to uh, put into place um, some uh, Idumeans uh, to kind of rule in this area for them. Uh, and it's going to be uh, two brothers, but then one brother is going to kind of fall out of favor with the Romans. And Herod, Herod is going to rise as the key political influence in this area. So most people who read the New Testament are familiar with Herod the Great um, as during the time in which Jesus was born, uh, again, according to the time of uh, to the book of Matthew, who records this. So, uh, so I have scriptures, uh, Daniel 10 through 12, the reason I have that is because this material is kind of apocalyptic, uh, is most likely written during the time of the uh, uprising against Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, and so if someone wants to see a kind of a sketch of events that are happening up to the time of that revolt against Antiochus and uh, what the hope is during the time of, of Antiochus and the Hasmonean uh, revolt, uh, Daniel 10 through 12 is a, is a biblical source for that. Of course, there are other non-biblical sources that give details, but if you're looking for scripture uh, for that, Daniel 10 through 12 uh, would uh, provide that in this apocalyptic vision. Uh, as far as getting up to Herod the Great, uh, of course, Matthew 1, we could also add here Matthew 2 as well, the, kind of the birth of Jesus, and uh, then Herod the Great's um, attempt to kill children in Bethlehem, uh, and then Luke 1 and 2, which also talks about the birth of uh, John the Baptist and also the birth of Jesus uh, taking place during, uh, during this time. So that's a very brief uh, description of these kind of two periods. So what I'll now do is jump to um, uh, the kind of the Grecian Empire. Uh, primarily, this is with Alexander the Great. Uh, and so uh, Alexander was somebody who, you know, uh, rose in prominence after his father was assassinated. Of course, there's always been kind of speculations whether or not Alexander was involved with those assassination plots, but putting those kinds of things aside, Alexander rises and he tries to do what his father had planned to do, and that is go into Asia Minor, recapture um, cities, uh, Greek cities that were in present-day Turkey that had been taken over by the Persians, and to reclaim those. Uh, and so he goes into uh, Asia Minor, recaptures those successfully, uh, and then begins a push or march against the Persians. And he is very successful. Persia, the Persian Empire, is, seems to be kind of weak in terms of what it can do militarily uh, against the push of Alexander. And he moves through Syria, moves down through Palestine, um, uh, into Egypt, and then takes his armies and moves westward, uh, excuse me, eastward, as he goes into places like Iran, Iraq, uh, all the way into portions of what we would today call Pakistan or India. Uh, so a very successful military uh, campaign. Uh, and so, but uh, Alexander is going to die um, while he is on these campaigns way out in the east which is going to cause uh, turmoil in all these conquered countries. Uh, and it's going to be amongst his uh, generals who are going to kind of divide up his empire and rule in his, uh, you know, after his death. Uh, one of the kind of th key things that's very interesting to note about uh, Alexander and as he would conquer places, one of the things within Hellenistic culture 
is this kind of permission or allowing, um, well, I'll call them Jews here, but we might better say uh, Judeans. Uh, the term Jew is really a term that develops later on, but if we'll use the term Jew or Judeans to worship and practice their own religions as they wish. So in other words, you're not coming in here and saying, well, your God are no gods, and now we're going to force you to worship uh, our gods. But, um, you know, there's this idea of, well, there are many gods, and everybody on all these different cultures have their own gods, and Greek gods can just cohabit along with these other gods, and everybody can worship their own gods. Uh, and so kind of, you know, at first, what you'll have is just leaving Judeans to worship their own gods. Uh, and so there were probably attempts to introduce gods of other cultures, gods of the Greeks, and maybe some Judeans may have looked upon these gods somewhat favorably and wanting to give them reverence. But of course, there's a very strong line here for many Jews because uh, they recognize that only Yahweh should be worshiped in, in their temple. Uh, so there should not be any other gods in that temple to, to be worshipped. Uh, and so there's this period um, where there, there's a lot of Greek influence in terms of how to organize the governments, um, how to um, introduce Greek culture within the region. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a, a time of a great deal of upheaval and changes that are going on while Judeans are still trying to maintain what they see as this kind of exclusive, exclusive worship of Yahweh uh, in the temple. So uh, under Greek rule, one of the things we do have are the diaspora Jews. And, um, you know, so of course there are Jews who are living outside of Palestine long before the Greeks come in. There are Jews who who are living in Egypt. Uh, there are Jews who are living um, in Babylon. And I'm using this term Jews once again to refer to Judeans uh, or these people who feel an ancestry to Palestine, uh, to this land, and to the uh, faith community that uh, focuses on Jerusalem uh, as the place where our Yahweh is to be worshipped. So many of these people are living all over uh, the, the world, but particularly as well under um, under Greek rule, uh, either through the Ptolemies in, from Egypt or through the Syrians in the north. Uh, there are Jews who are moving about, and they are living in lots of different places now around the, the world, sometimes out of necessity uh, because of famine, or sometimes they're, they're taken as slaves. Um, but whatever, sometimes economic opportunities, but for whatever reason, Jews who live outside of Palestine are seen or referred to as diaspora Jews. And many of these Jews are kind of absorbing Greek culture. Of course, they're so absorbing Greek language as well. So the primary language that they speak is Greek. Uh, they want their scriptures uh, in Greek. So translation of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible is done in, uh, in the Greek language. Uh, and so Jews are learning to be adaptable and to absorb and to negotiate uh, life amongst uh, Greeks uh, during this period after Alexander's conquest and after the subsequent uh, rulers. And so this term that we use is Hellenization. Of course, the word uh, Helen, Hellenus uh, comes from the Greek word that is used to describe the Greeks. And so they're from the Hellas point. And um, so Hellenization then is this fostering of Greek culture, Greek language, Greek, Greek religion. Um, and there are several kind of Jewish or Judean reactions to Hellenizations. There are some who are eager to adopt Hellenization, take on the, the language, uh, fit in with the, the, the culture, uh, take on dress, take on education. There are others who are kind of unwillingly complied with it. In other words, they don't like it. It's kind of different than the culture that they've associated with, with their uh, ancestors, um, although even some of that may be romanticized since a lot of that culture developed while they were in Babylonian captivity. Um, but so a kind of, and then adapted as, again under Persian uh, rule. 
but they have some kind of romanticized view of what that culture should be uh, from previous years, but nevertheless had to comply because now to prosper or to succeed or to thrive, you, you need it to interact with the Greeks. And then there certainly were those who resisted it. In, their, in other words, they didn't want to speak the Greek language. They didn't want to have anything to do with uh, these uh, foreigners or these strangers and their strange ways and their strange gods. And so we're going to have different kinds of Jews who have who see themselves or align themselves uh, with this Greek influence uh, in this way. And so all of this is going to come to a head, in particular, with this one Greek ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV, um, who is this ruler under the, the Seleucids, uh, and how he tries to push Hellenization and how different Jews are reacting to those attempts. But we will do all of that in another video. So we'll leave that 